Hallelujah. Um, you know, tomorrow is a significant anniversary for our country. It was 68 years ago tomorrow that the sovereign nation of Japan launched an attack against the United States in Pearl Harbor. An unprovoked attack, unexpected, sudden, uh, December 7th, 1941, uh, and uh, it plunged our country and most of the world into World War II. Some 2,400 casualties as a result of Pearl Harbor, uh, most of them sailors, but also Marines and other uh, military personnel as well as civilians were killed. But it, it began a war that we call the Second World War, and it really was a world war because only eight nations in all the world remained neutral throughout the whole course of World War II. Now you think about that. It was, this was a war uh, unparalleled in human history. It was a war that would rage for four bloody years until uh, in August of 1945, the United States dropped atomic bombs, one on Hiroshima, one on Nagasaki. Uh, those weapons were the most devastating weapons ever unleashed in human history. The bomb in Hiroshima killed some estimated 140,000 people. The bomb in Nagasaki, another 70,000. And the, the full total, the full scale of those casualties will really never be known because the fallout, the repercussions of atomic weapons uh, is still is still an unknown quantity to this day. But this was a war unparalleled in scale, unparalleled in ferocity, unparalleled in bloodshed in human history. Never before have so many people died uh, in, in such a short time. In fact, estimates range anywhere from 30 million to 50 million people died as a result of World War II. December 7th, 1941 uh, is the anniversary. Tomorrow's the anniversary of that date, 1941. As horrible as it was, as hellish as it was, World War II is going to pale in comparison of the devastation that's soon to be unleashed upon planet Earth. If World War II was bloody, ferocious, and unparalleled in some 30 to 50 million deaths, then human words fail to describe the judgment, the bloodshed, the horrors that are very soon going to be unleashed upon our planet. In fact, we're about to face a time on earth so hellish, so unprecedented, that our words fail. We actually have to turn to the Bible to see how the Bible describes the days that are just ahead for planet earth. Now, uh, you're in Daniel 9, right? Keep your finger here, but look with me over to chapter 12. I want to read just a verse or two over here. Daniel 12, listen to the description the Bible gives us of these last days that are just ahead for us, not just as a nation, but as a planet. Verse 1 Daniel 12 and verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the nation of thy people. And consider this, There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. 
there's going to be a time of trouble. Now, this is a prophetic reference to the great tribulation that is just ahead for planet Earth. A time of trouble unlike anything that ever was on the planet before. Jesus described it this way. I want you to consider Jesus' words. I'm going to read a passage from Matthew 24. You don't have to turn there. You can just listen if you like. But in Matthew 24, this is what Jesus said, verse 21. For there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now here's what Jesus said. Days at the end of time, so horrendous, so horrible, so nightmarish, that in Jesus' words, unless God intervened, the world would annihilate itself. There would be no, no one left. No flesh would be left. But for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened. God will intervene. Times so horrible. We're not talking about 30 million deaths, 40 million deaths, or 50 million deaths. We're talking about death of such proportion that if God didn't intervene, there'd be nobody left alive. In fact, the plagues that are to come, the war that is to come, the judgments that are to come, will decimate at least half of the earth's population so that the death toll won't be counted in millions, but in billions. Jesus said in Luke 21 and verse 25, he said, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. He speaks of a day when God will pour out his wrath upon earth. You know, God has been very long-suffering. He's been long-suffering with you and me and long-suffering with mankind. But there have been times in history where God's long-suffering wore out. There were times when God said, you've gone that far, and that's as far as you go. It happened in the days of Noah when the earth was so full of violence and rebellion and defiance against God when mankind was riddled with harlotry idolatry and demonism to such an extent that God said that's as far as it goes and he drew a line and the earth perished in Noah's flood we've seen judgments of un unparalleled nature against Sodom and Gomorrah when God said that's as far as it goes and it goes no more Amen. hello Amen. there are times when God says that's as far as it goes Amen. there was a time when God drew a line across the middle of the Red Sea Egypt for all of their rebellion and defiance and pride and arrogance and oppression of others God drew a line he drew it right across the middle of the Red Sea he said Egypt that's as far as you go you go no more you cross that line and that's the end the Bible tells us that time is soon coming for planet earth where God will once again say that's as far as it goes and he's going to wind up the affairs on earth as we know it you know this is something that's predicted this great tribulation period uh, isn't something that somebody made up just to scare people the Bible is full of prophecies of these last days and if we believe the Bible if we take it literally just like uh, we reminded you earlier Jesus said not one jot not one tittle will fail to come to pass it's going to come to pass we take the Bible literally, then the earth is headed 
for horrendous times. Uh, if you'll keep your finger in Daniel, I would like to have you turn with me to the book of Isaiah. I'd like to read a passage or two there, if you wouldn't mind. Isaiah 24. Now, I know that uh, this message today isn't the kind of message that makes you want to stand up and shout. But you know what? We need to realize what the Bible says is just ahead. Just ahead. I, I'm not talking about in our distant future. But just ahead, so near, so near that you can almost see it. Isaiah contains a section uh, in his prophecies, the book of Isaiah, that actually is called the Little Apocalypse. It's a little piece. You know, Isaiah had profound insight to the Great Tribulation period. And he describes it in some detail, beginning in chapter 24. But I want you to notice verse 1, when God says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. He's going to desolate the earth. Now, Isaiah 24, 1. The Lord makes the, the earth empty. He's going to desolate it. He makes it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Look, verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken this word. Down in verse 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Now, he goes beyond speaking of judgments that will befall Israel and Jerusalem here. He's speaking of judgments upon earth. He's speaking upon a decimate he's speaking of a decimation of the population where few will be left. Notice uh, we'll skip down to verse 19. He says the earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Now we're going to read in the next couple of weeks in Revelation beginning in chapter 6 and going on through chapter 19 about the judgments of the great tribulation that are soon to ravage planet earth but here we are 700 years or so before Christ came on the earth and here we are 2000 years after that and we're reading of prophecies that Isaiah says are going to occur in the very last days he says in verse 20 the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again and it shall come to pass in that day now he's not talking here about a 24 hour day but in a he's talking about a period of time in that day in that time the Lord will punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Oh, listen, there's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day of punishment. He's speaking here of the last days of the earth. Uh, in chapter 2 of Isaiah, let me run over there real quick and read another verse or two. Chapter 2 of Isaiah now, obviously, these judgments haven't come to pass yet. The earth hasn't reeled to and fro like a drunkard. Judgments haven't fallen uh, on such a world scale that they could be described in that kind of language yet. But this is language that speaks of the great tribulation and the judgments that... Uh, of the seals and the bowls and the vials that are soon to come, the trumpets. He says in chapter 2 and verse 19, 
he says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man will cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and to the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. To shake terribly the earth. There's coming a day... When all of man's, what is it that people live for? Uh, the, their gold and silver, their wealth and riches, whatever it is, their own happiness, their own pleasure. The day's coming when none of your wealth, none of your strength, none of your investments are going to deliver you. None of it's going to deliver you. There's coming a day when God will arise, the Bible says. He's going to say, that's far enough. And the earth will be shaken in a manner so unprecedented that, that words virtually fail to describe it. But as we read in the weeks ahead, in Revelation 6 and, and following, we'll see the nature of the judgments that God says he has reserved for planet earth. If the judgments that fell upon Egypt were terrifying and horrible, once again, they will pale in comparison to the judgments God has reserved for the earth for its wickedness for its rebellion for its sins for its pride for its arrogance for its haughtiness for its idolatry for its adultery this isn't a time to shrug your shoulders at sin and worldliness and compromise with the devil and the flesh it's a time for sobriety and a time for uh, serious commitment to Christ remember Jesus' words pray pray that you be able to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man some are going to escape Lord let us be in that number that's, that's to be our continual prayer let us be in that number <clears throat> I want you to again notice that he says here in chapter 2 and 19 that God's going to violently shake the whole earth, the earth. Not one city or not one nation, but the earth. So you won't be safe if you move to the city. You won't be safe if you move to the country. You won't be safe if you move to the mountains. You won't be safe if you move to the desert. You won't be safe if you move to some little secluded island. You won't be safe if you move to a foreign country. Where can you hide? from the eyes of God. Remember Jesus called this Matthew 24 a time of great tribulation. Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. Unlike anything the earth has ever seen. There are synonyms that the Bible uses for this period of time, this day of the Lord, this great tribulation. It's called the great tribulation. It's called the hour of trial. It's called in the Bible the hour of temptation. It's called the great day of the Lord. It's called the day of wrath, the day of indignation. It's called the time of destruction, a time of destitution, a time of desolation, a time of punishment. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the hour of wrath. Uh, I want you to hear how John describes it, or actually it's described in the book of Revelation. It's called the great day of God's wrath. Listen to this in, in Revelation 6, where the Lord describes it. This way, uh, Revelation 6, beginning in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him 
that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who will be able to stand? Who will be able to stand? So it's referred to by all of these, we could call them synonyms, all of these descriptions. Uh, specifically, this great tribulation period is a period of seven years. The last seven years of earth as we know it. It's uh, that period that's described in much more detail over there in uh, Revelation 6, 7, 8, 9. But today what I want us to consider is another designation that the Bible gives to this last seven years on planet Earth. It's called Daniel's 70th week. Now, I don't know if you're familiar, how familiar you may be with the book of Daniel and the prophecies in the book of Daniel. But Daniel has some of the most incredible prophecies in all the Bible. And specifically in chapter 9, he speaks of the Great Tribulation. And it's called, we refer to it as Daniel's 70th week. So, uh, do you still have your finger in Daniel 9? All right, good, because uh, that's where I want you to be. In Daniel 9, we're going to read a couple of verses over here. Uh, we're going to read a few verses here and see if we can't decipher it and come to an understanding of uh, one of the most profound passages in all of the Bible. And uh, that's, that's not an overstatement. The Bible makes some incredible, it has some incredible prophecies. The Bible describes things... Uh, you know, 700 years before Christ, Isaiah 7:14 says the Messiah would come and be born of a virgin. I mean, that's pretty incredible, right? 700 years before his birth, uh, Isaiah 9:6 says not only is Messiah coming, not only is he going to be born of a virgin, but th this Messiah, he's going to be God himself. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, Amen. the everlasting Father, the Prince, Prince of Peace. Amen. Hello. Amen. You've got passages like Micah 5 and verse 2 that says not only is Messiah coming, but let me tell you where he's going to be born. He'll be born in Bethlehem of Judea. I mean... The Bible's full of incredible, powerful prophecies that this is no coincidence. It makes the Bible unique in all the earth. There's no book like it. Quran does not have such prophecies. Uh, the Hindu Vedas have no such prophecies. The, the Buddhist Tripitaka has no such prophetic prophecies. No religion on earth, no religion on earth predicts the future with such clarity, such accuracy. And then read the Psalms, the Psalms, how full are they of Messianic prophecies that, that describe in detail, they gambled for my garments, <coughs> not a bone of him would be broken. Uh, just incredible prophecies. But of all the Old Testament prophecies, Daniel's is unique. Unique for several reasons, and I, I want us to to see if we can grasp that today. Are you with me in Daniel 9? All right, we're going to read it. Let's just begin in verse 1. And let me just give you a little bit of a, a background here. Daniel, you know, as a youth, was taken into captivity, removed from his home in Israel, dragged into Babylon, where he lived his whole life. And now, at this point, he's an old man. He's no longer a youth. And as an old man in Babylon, God has blessed him in Babylon. But as an old man in Babylon, he's reading the scriptures. Specifically, he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah the prophet. And in the scroll of Jeremiah the prophet, there are some incredible prophecies. 
Chapter 25, chapter 29. Well, of course, we divide it up into chapters. It really wasn't divided in chapters in those days. But he's reading in those sections. And those sections specifically declare, Jeremiah said, the captivity, when, you, when you're dragged off into Babylon, you know, Jeremiah said, it's going to happen. You're going to be dragged off into Babylon and you're going to stay there for 70 years. Now, Daniel is reading this. And he's realizing, hey, the 70 years, they're up. This is it. We're, the 70 years have, have just about expired. You know, here's something pretty amazing. Daniel believed that what the prophets prophesied was true. He believed it. So, verse 1, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened to thy servants the prophets which spoke in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers and to all the people of the land. See, he has, he has read that the 70 years are, are about expired. And in realizing that, it's time for Israel to go home. He starts praying, oh God, oh God, you are so faithful to your word. And we know why we're here. We know why we're bound. We know why we're in captivity. It's because we've been rebellious. There should never be any doubt in our minds. Now, we may not all be carried off to Babylon, but let me tell you, a lot of people are bound up and in captivity. And it's usually because of our own sins and rebellions. Sometimes the Lord just allows us to go through trials. We realize that. Sometimes there's no reason that we can understand why we go through what we go through. But I'm going to tell you a lot of times we know exactly why we're going through what we're going through. It's because of our own rebellion and defiance and disobedience. And they knew, Daniel knew, and Daniel's praying not only for himself but for his people. Oh God, we have sinned. Now look with me. We're going to skip down to verse 17. He says, Now therefore, O Lord God, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Remember, the land of Israel has been abandoned, decimated, everything destroyed he says verse 18 oh my God incline thine ear and hear open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses but for thy great mercies he's not saying Lord we deserve to be restored to our land he's saying Lord we don't deserve it but Lord, because of your mercies, restore us. Fulfill your promises. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And God heard. And in verse 20, he says, While I was speaking and praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Look, when you pray, when you repent, when you confess your sin, God hears. He does not turn a deaf ear to a prayer of repentance. He does not turn a deaf ear to a prayer of genuine sorrow and remorse. 
He will never turn away his ear from a prayer of repentance. Not when, not when you, not when you mean it. Not if it's, you know, not if it's a pretense, that's another matter because God knows the heart. But here we go. I was praying. And while I was speaking in prayer, verse 21, even the man Gabriel, <laughs> excuse me, even the man Gabriel, now he's speaking here about the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision." God sent Gabriel the angel. He's the messenger angel. He sent him to Daniel with the answer to his prayer, with a message, and, and not just for what he was praying for immediately, but God gave Daniel a profound vision of God's clock, God's prophetic clock that encompassed from the, that time until the end of the ages. God gave him something that's unparalleled. Un, it, it, it doesn't appear anywhere else. He gave him this incredible prophecy beginning in verse 24. He says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Seventy weeks, he's talking here about the coming of Messiah, where transgressions will be finally dealt with, reconciliation for iniquity will be accomplished, everlasting righteousness ushered in, the anointing of the Most Holy, he says, Know therefore and understand, verse 25, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. In verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. It seems a little bit cryptic, uh, like maybe the message isn't as clear as uh, we would like it to be. But what we have here is actually a blueprint a blueprint for world events that would revolve around the Jewish people and Jerusalem. The angel here gives Daniel some very specific details about the coming Messiah. And then he skips all the way to the very last days and the tribulation of the last seven years on planet Earth. He says, and when we read this passage, beginning 24, 25, 26, and 27, it seems to declare that all of human history will be wrapped up in 70 weeks. Now, since Daniel wrote this some 500 plus years before Messiah, 
And since 70 weeks is only a period of about a year and a half, <laughs> uh, it doesn't add up. So it's important for us to realize that in the Bible, a week can mean two things. It can mean a week of days, but it can also mean a week of years. You know, sometimes in the Bible, it refers to a week, uh, not a week of days, but a week of years. And that's pretty obvious. The, uh, the idea comes from the Greek word week. Uh, I mean, the Hebrew word week. The Hebrew word is shabuah. It means seven. So when Daniel prophesies 70 weeks, he actually is speaking of 77s. 77s. And I'm going to try not to get technical here because I don't want anybody to get confused. But the Jews were very familiar with this terminology because they had a seventh day Sabbath. Every seventh day in a week, the seventh day was a Sabbath. But they also had a seven-year Sabbath because at the end of seven years, that was a Sabbath year where the land was to rest. They also had, when you multiply that, a 50th year uh, year of Jubilee after seven sevens of years. So uh, every 50th year, a year of Jubilee, this was not unfamiliar to the Jews. Let's also remember what Laban told Jacob. I want you to think back to Genesis when... Remember uh, Jacob fell in love with a beautiful girl named Rachel? And he wanted to marry her. He said, I'll work for you. I'll work for you, Laban, for seven years if you'll let me marry Rachel. He said, no problem. You work for me seven years. So, so he did. He worked seven years for her. And then Laban tricked him, and he married the oldest daughter, Leah, instead. He didn't realize who he was marrying. That must have been some kind of veil. But anyway, he, he married Leah. And after he married Lee and he realized what happened, what he had done, he'd been tricked by, by his uh, father-in-law, Laban. Uh, Genesis 29, verse 27, this is what Laban told Jacob. Now, now consider this, because this is his exact words. He said, you want to marry Rachel? Then fulfill her week. Fulfill her week, and you can marry her too. Work with me for seven more years. So you see, a week can be a week of years. That's what he was talking about. You fulfill her week. Work for me seven more years, and I'll, I'll give you Rachel too. So the Jews were familiar with this kind of language. Uh, and all the way back into the, in the book of Genesis, you see that a week can be a week of days or it can be a week of years. So I want us to see if we can grasp the nature of this prophecy because it's profound. He says, verse 24, look with me there, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, to bring in everlasting righteousness, this has got to be the establishment of Christ's kingdom. So, he says, seventy weeks... That's what it's going to take, and everything's going to be wound up. Now, we know it wasn't 70 weeks of days, so he's obviously referring to 70 weeks of years, but then that poses another problem. Because 70 weeks of years is only 490 years. And obviously, Messiah hasn't ushered in his kingdom yet, and 490 years came and passed before Messiah was even born, after uh, Daniel gave this prophecy. So... There's a few little problems to be ironed out uh, in all of this. But let's see if we can iron it out. He goes on in verse 25, and he breaks it down even further. Remember verse 24, seven, it's going to take 70 weeks. But now he breaks it down. He makes a, a distinction between the first 69 weeks and then the final week of verse 27. Verse 25, therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Okay, now this is a significant piece of information. 
from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that's going to start something. That, that date that where it's ordered for Jerusalem to be restored, rebuilt, including, he goes on and says, the streets and the walls. He says unto the Messiah, the prince, it'll be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, score is 20. So, so three score is how many? 60. And two is, we got 62 weeks. And then you've got seven, he speaks of four. Before that, you've got uh, the three score and two, that's 62, and the seven. You see the seven? So you've got a total of 69 weeks that he's referring to here. And let's see if we can't run, run together with this and see if we can put it together and make sense out of it. He speaks here of 69 weeks. That's seven weeks plus the 62 weeks. That equals 69 weeks, and those are weeks of years, so the total is 483 years. There will be a test. So Daniel is saying the clock starts on the day the commandment is issued to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, and of course you've got to remember it includes the streets and the, and the walls and so forth of Jerusalem because the Bible records several decrees that were given to go rebuild the temple. Uh, there's a decree of Cyrus in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. There's a decree of Darius in Ezra chapter 6. There's a decree of Artaxerxes in Ezra chapter 7. Uh, a number of these decrees were issued, but you have to discount those because they were to rebuild the temple. While verse 26 specifically says the streets will be built, the walls. So this decree wasn't issued until uh, the 20th year of Artaxerxes. It's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah 2, the decree was issued to go rebuild the walls, rebuild the streets, rebuild the city itself, not just the temple. So the clock starts in Nehemiah 2 with the order to go and build the city. That's when the clock starts. God's prophetic clock. He says 70 weeks. There's going to be 70 weeks, but he divides it into two parts. 69 weeks first, and then a final week. A 70th week that we see in, chapter, in uh, verse 27. Now, historians are all over the place in dating this edict uh, of uh, Artaxerxes in the 20th year of his reign. Uh, many date it to 445 B.C. In fact, uh, some scholars, this Sir Robert Anderson who probably did more research on this subject than any human being in history. He, he was a Scotland Yard uh, guy. But this fella uh, specifically dates it the middle of March, B.C. 445. Uh, there have been others who've, who've dated it earlier. Uh, 457 B.C. is a, a popular date for when that edict may have been issued. It's hard to get the experts to agree uh, on the dates. And I will tell you this, there have been far greater minds and intellects than mine that have poured over this uh, information and these historical records. Some of it gets a little bit confusing when you start factoring in the differences between the Hebrew calendar and the Julian calendar and making room for leap years and the the ancient calendars were, were years of 30-day uh, months. You, you know, they only had 30 days in a month. That's uh, Every month had 30 days. But then the Julian calendar, which was a little different, you got to transport, you know, transpose it all over, and you, it, it, it can get a little confusing. But here's what they agree on. You add the seven weeks and the 62 weeks together to come up with the 69 weeks of years, or 483 years, that that actually did specifically culminate in the arrival of Messiah in Jerusalem during the Passover just before his crucifixion. In fulfillment not only of Daniel's prophecy but all the other prophecies. Zechariah 9.9 9, Rejoice Greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. 
He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. Zechariah prophesied it, and here he came. I want to read something to you from Robert Anderson, uh, from his book, The Coming Prince. He said, no more, uh, I'm sorry, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, an error therefore of sixty-nine weeks or four hundred and eighty-three prophetic years, reckoned from the 14th March B.C. 445. It should close with some event to satisfy the words unto Messiah the Prince. No student of the gospel narrative can fail to see that the Lord's last visit to Jerusalem was not only in fact, but in the purpose of it, the crisis of his ministry. Now the twofold testimony of his words and his works had been fully rendered, and his entry into the holy city was to proclaim his messiahship and to receive his doom. And the date of it can be ascertained. In accordance with the Jewish custom, the Lord went up to Jerusalem upon the eighth Nisan, six days before the Passover, but as the 14th on which the Paschal Supper was eaten fell that year on a Thursday, the 8th was the preceding Friday. He must have spent the Sabbath, therefore, at Bethany, and on the evening of the 9th, after the Sabbath had ended, the supper took place in Martha's house. Upon the following day, the 10th Nisan, he entered Jerusalem as recorded in the Gospels. The Julian date of that 10th Nisan was Sunday, April the 6th, A.D. 32. What then was the length of the period intervening between the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the public advent of Messiah the Prince between the 14th March B.C. 445 and the 6th April A.D. 32? The interval contained exactly and to the very day 1,000 uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 173,880 days are seven times 69 prophetic years of 360 days, exactly the first 69 weeks of Gabriel's prophecy. Dwight Pentecost says, Thus Anderson shows us that the 69 weeks began with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and terminated at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the Sunday, the week of the Lord's death. The corrected reading of Luke 19.42, spoken as our Lord came into Jerusalem on that day, is most significant. If thou also hadst known, even on this day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. The accuracy of Daniel's prophecy is observed in that he states, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. I mean, these guys calculate it to the day. They break those, those years, those 69 weeks down into uh, 483 years, the years down into years of 360 days, and to the very day. To the very day, 483 years after the issuance of the uh, Artaxerxes edict, Jesus, the Messiah, rode into Jerusalem. Now, I don't, where you, I don't know where you would find anything more accurate or more convincing that the Bible is 100% trustworthy. Verse 26 here in Daniel says, He was cut off. That is, he was crucified, but not for himself. Obviously, he didn't die for his sins. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, right? So, so that death, with the death of the Messiah, remember, the clock started. The stopwatch started the date the edict was issued for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. It started, the stopwatch started... And at 69 weeks to the day, when Messiah was cut off, the stopwatch stopped with one week left to be fulfilled. We are now living in what the scholars call 
a prophetic parenthesis. The watch is on pause, and it's been on pause since the crucifixion of Christ. So the whole church age is basically a parenthesis. But the watch is soon to start again, very soon to start again, where the final week in God's timetable, God's prophetic calendar, the final week will be fulfilled. Now remember, these are weeks of years, weeks of years. So there are seven years left after this pause is completed and it's about to run out seven years left and that is the seven years of the great tribulation the one final week now you're still with me in Daniel all right I hope you're not thoroughly confused but let's notice verse 26 when he says and the people of the prince that shall come the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, guess what? The prince that shall come is a synonym for Antichrist. There are two princes spoken of in this passage. There is Messiah the prince, but then there is this prince who shall come. This is Antichrist. It's a prophetic reference to Antichrist. And it's very significant what he says here because he speaks of not only a future time when Israel will go home, but a future desolation and destruction of their temple, which would be accomplished by the people of the prince who shall come. Now, who destroyed, after Jesus' death, who destroyed Israel in the temple? The Romans! you get a gold star <laughs> and that means if it's the people of the prince that shall come that means Antichrist will have a Roman heritage he will be a European remember these are the pe people of the prince that shall come they're the ones who are going to destroy the temple destroy the tabernacle. that would happen after Jesus' death years later Y'all with me? That tells us Antichrist is European. He will come from a revived Roman Empire of some sort, uh, a European confederacy of nations of some sort. We also believe, because of other things Daniel tells us, that uh, he's going to have some Jewish heritage as well, which would be quite logical. But Antichrist is going to come from some revived confederacy. And then we come to a gap. This is not the gap theory, which is a little different. I'll have Brother Dave Prentice describe the, explain the gap theory to you. But this is a prophetic parenthesis between verse 26 and verse 27. And we are living in between these two verses right now. We are living in that time of para, uh, prophetic parenthesis. The 69 weeks have already been fulfilled, and that should show us that the 70th week is going to be fulfilled as well. And verse 27, the 70th week, or Daniel's 70th week, let's notice this. It's going to begin, the clock is going to start again with a covenant. The, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's, that's Daniel's 70th week. That's the last seven years of the earth. And in the middle of the week, or three and a half years into the tribulation, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he will make it desolate. Four times in Daniel, he refers to the abomination that maketh desolate. Antichrist. Uh, even in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God or that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself or declaring himself or proclaiming himself that he is God. There's going to be a last day temple. Antichrist is going to desecrate it. Antichrist is going to proclaim himself to be God in that temple in the last days. And when is he going to do that? In the middle of Daniel's 70th week. 
in the middle, three and a half years into the Great Tribulation. Are you with me? All right. He will make this covenant with Israel, and when he does, click the clock, because it's running again. It's all, it's all going to happen. Remember, a lot of things are going to happen all at one time. Uh, there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous dead. There's going to be a rapture of the overcomers, the first fruits. There's going to be, uh, you know, that rapture of the ready church. That, that's all going to happen. There's going to be the removal of the restrainer. That is, he's going to remove his restraints and let wickedness flow out like a flood. There's going to be war in heaven. Uh, the devil and his angels are going to be banished from heaven, banished to the earth, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, knowing that his time is short. All of these things are going to happen quickly. Antichrist is going to rise to power. There will be a confederation of European nations, a powerful, powerful military, political, economic power in Europe. Antichrist is going to have a meteoric rise to power, and he will personally guarantee a covenant with Israel so that their temple can be rebuilt. All of this is going to happen, and it's going to happen very, very, very soon, very soon. Um, the clock starts again. But, you know, for Daniel 9.27 to come to pass, I want you to think of what has to happen. Now, now Dan, remember, Daniel prophesied this 530-something years before Christ. But for, for chapter 9 and verse 27 to come to pass, Israel has to be back in their own land. And, and that has to happen after the decimations of uh, verse 25 and 26. So, so that means this could not have been fulfilled until at least 1948. Not only that, but for chapter 20, for verse 27 to come to pass, for there to be a temple and so forth, Israel has to possess Jerusalem. That did not happen until 1967. This prophecy could not have been fulfilled before 1967. And for the rest of this to come to pass, Israel must have a temple. And that's going to, I believe that's going to happen faster than anybody can imagine. Much faster than anybody can imagine. There are some problems with them having a temple. For one thing, Israel itself is divided over the need for a temple, or the desire for a temple. Even now, amongst the Jews. A lot of them are totally apathetic towards a temple. Some are very zealous for a temple. Some couldn't care less. And then you've got another problem with the temple mount. Because the, you know, the Muslims have some little bitty edifice up there that they consider particularly sacred. You know, their Dome of the Rock. They believe Muhammad ascended to heaven from that place. Uh, and that's a bone of contention with Islam. Now, that means sometime very, very, very soon. Now, I want you to consider this because what I'm telling you has to come to pass. Very, very soon, something will happen. It will probably be something catastrophic. But something is going to happen that will result in Israel's ability to build a temple. Something is going to happen that's going to remove whatever is in the way as far as any physical hindrances, whether it's the Dome of the Rock or whatever must be removed. Something's going to happen in that sense, but something's going to have to give Israel the resolve to have a temple. Something is going to happen. Me, in my own mind, I can only imagine something absolutely catastrophic that could bring it to pass. It took World War II and the decimation of six million Jews to bring them to a nation again. I don't know what will happen, but I will tell you this. Something is going to change in the Middle East. It's going to be dramatic. It's going to be probably catastrophic. But the result will be Israel is going to build a temple.
That's going to be the result. Israel's going to build a temple, and one man is going to negotiate a treaty, or he will at least be largely responsible for bringing this to pass, and it'll be the man who heads up this European Union, this powerful military political thing that will far surpass the United States of America in prominence, prestige, power, and strength, militarily, economically, in every other way. And this man will enter into a covenant with Israel that will guarantee them their right to build a temple. Now, this isn't far ahead, beloved. This isn't far ahead. And you might think that, you know, this could take decades, this could take generations. It could happen almost overnight. Almost overnight. That's all it's going to take is for something to break out over there. All it's going to take is for Iran to say, you know what, we finally got our nukes. Let's see how they work. The world is about to change before our eyes. Our prayer should be, Lord, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Lord, let me be on that first bus. The prince who shall come is going to have everything to do with uh, negotiating this treaty, this guarantee, this covenant, verse 27, with Israel for one week. Guess what week that is? We've got 69 already accounted for. We're living in the pause right now in the prophetic parenthesis, but the clock is about to start again. And when that clock starts, let me tell you, nothing's going to stop it from starting. And once it starts, it's going to run the last seven years of planet Earth as we know it and culminate in the return of Christ to the Earth. He's going to stand on that Mount of Olives. He's going to destroy his enemies. And his church is going to come back with him. So for 2,000 years now, this watch has been paused. But you know, there's a limit to everything. And God finally says, you know what? That's far enough. And the clock's going to start again. Our responsibility, our responsibility is to be a ready people. Wise virgins, oil in our lamps, walking with God, walking by faith, pleasing God with our lives and our lifestyle. Remember, that's a testimony Enoch had. He walked with God. He had this testimony, please God. He walked by faith. Let, let you and I live our lives thinking th that, that this is what it's going to take. Not a time for spiritual silliness, but a time for spiritual preparation. I believe God has got John the Baptists all over the world right now telling the same thing John the Baptist said just before Messiah came. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Time to get ready. Church is not supposed to be babysitting spiritually retarded Christians where they just don't care about growing up. They just want to be, you know, coddled and uh, entertained and like a bunch of babies. That's not what the church is. It's not a babysitting service. It is boot camp. Church is boot camp. Getting us ready for the return of Christ. So, beloved, he's coming and nothing, nothing is going to stop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Well, Father, our prayer today is that you give us understanding, Lord, understanding that will result in resolve. Resolve, Lord, to be better men and better women. Lord, our prayer is that you change us, that you transform us, that you do whatever it takes in us to ready us. And prepare us for the days ahead. It's, it's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.